Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's time to talk about your gardening week. I'm Gardener Scott. Nice to have you here today. It looks like Florida is very well represented today. Good evening to Jean-Pierre. Good morning to Hot Pepper Paul. And hello to everybody else out there. Today, let's focus on why we garden. And I think this is a question we should all ask ourselves at various times of our gardening journey. In the beginning, all of us had probably one reason why we decided to start gardening. Maybe we really wanted to focus on growing our own food, or maybe we recognized that we could save money by growing some of the plants that we could in our garden. Maybe we had a friend that really enjoyed gardening, so we wanted some of that enjoyment in our own backyard. Maybe it's just one of those things where you wanted to recreate a memory from your childhood because somebody that you loved and remembered well had been a gardener. Maybe you just want to get out and get some exercise. You want to be out in the sun and nature. That's another great reason to garden. There are so many reasons, and I definitely want to see your reasons, that we really can't put all of us into the same basket for why we garden. We all do it, but we do it for different reasons. And the reason I think we should ask this question of ourselves periodically, the reason can change. And I actually think the reason should change over time. That's really a great way to grow into a well-balanced gardener, is to recognize that you have all of these reasons to garden, and you can do all of them. You don't have to just choose one. And so as you evolve, and as you become a better gardener, you just keep packing all of these reasons into your garden bag, and keep finding new reasons to garden. I've discovered that in recent years, even though I've had my YouTube channel for about 10 years, it's really only been the last three or four years that I really started focusing on making the videos and building the Gardner Scott channel. And that became a big reason of why I was gardening. I was doing things in my garden I had never done before for the purpose of making videos. So you can see it runs the gamut. There are a, a million reasons why you can choose to garden, and all of them are good. And it's all part of the journey. So let's see what else we have. Yogi Lai is saying, nothing tastes better than fresh garden produce. Also, I love watching the plants grow. Yeah. How many of you just sit in your garden? I say this on a pretty regular basis. Just sit in your garden. Just watch it. Just observe. Just be part of nature. That's a great reason to have a garden. The relaxation part, that's big for me. I, not that I lead a particularly stressful life, but it is nice to get out in the early evening after a hot day and just enjoy the garden space. Gardens Happens always wanted to turn the backyard into a mini food forest. Great idea. This is one of those things, and, and I haven't talked a lot about the food forest that I'm developing, but great reason. Great reason to, to plan ahead in the plants you're growing and what the focus of your garden is going to be. <coughs> Pepper Paul quotes Jess that store-bought tomatoes taste like disappointment. I think that's a, a great idea. I, I actually broke down and bought a, an heirloom tomato at the store recently, and it was for a future video, but it, it almost felt like I was, was cheating, like I was going to disappoint my garden because I haven't bought tomatoes at the store in years. I'm just so disappointed by them that I just don't do it anymore. And so I've got the tomato plants in my garden. They're not quite ready to harvest, but it felt like I was cheating on my garden to buy one at the store, even though I did it with the intent to make a video. So I completely agree with that. 
uh, Chandy's Garden and saying the process is amazing. Just being a small part of it is humbling. <laughs> Absolutely. It changes so often and it's glorious to witness. So uh, how, how do you approach your garden? Do you also find it amazing? I hope so. Do you find that relaxation? Do you find that disappointment that you are cheating on your garden? It's those kind of things I think are important. Sunset gazing. I garden to exercise, experiment on what works, and to sweat my tush off. That's a good one. I think that's a, a wonderful thing to, to be doing in your garden. Absolutely. Let's see. <coughs> John Pierre saying, I want to do good for Mother Nature, and in the process of that, growing great crops that taste better than those from the store. Absolutely. Heidi gardens for the inner satisfaction and the ability to be with nature. I also want to know where my food comes from and to share with neighbors. Excellent, excellent. So this week, my squash has been coming in great. And I harvested about 30 pounds of zucchini and yellow squash. And a big reason why I garden is is the satisfaction of harvesting. And it's the challenge of actually getting a harvest in my environment. I gave it all away. I take it back. I, I did roast up one of the squashes. But I get satisfaction out of that as well. That's a big reason why I garden, is to share that excitement with everybody else. That's why I share it with you every week. That's why I make the videos. And the actual harvest for me is not as important as the process and as the I spend the time out in the garden relishing that enjoyment that I get. So, yeah, like you, I give most of it away. I'll be giving a lot more away over the course of this growing season, and I think <coughs> that is absolutely a, a good approach to it. Baldi G or Diet says my mom, mom died from cancer and passed her garden tools on to me. I'm sorry to hear that. So it only felt right to carry on her passion. And I fell in love with gardening, grew potatoes and carrots. Now, awesome for you. Absolutely awesome. And and that's that's another great reason. It really is. My parents did not garden. I have shared the story about my aunt who gardened. But I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing for my kids, passing on that passion. And they're starting. They're starting to pick it up. <clears throat> they're both in their 30s now. They, they both have kids. And they're starting to recognize garden gardening for themselves in just a small way that I recognize it for myself. So, yes, carrying on a legacy from your parents or a special friend or someone else in your family is is a great reason. Thank you for, for sharing that. Lama Lama says, uh, my reasons, you're one to two. I remember as a kid, it was the coolest thing to go outside at my friend's house and snack. There you go. Years three to current, after observing nature, it stopped me much about life. Very spiritual, absolutely. And and that's a good way to say it. It, it can be very spiritual in the garden. <clears throat> depending on how you look at it, depending on your philosophy. If, if you're all about the work, all about the food, all about the production, you might lose some of that spirituality. But that's why I say ask the question of yourself on a regular basis, because in the beginning, it might just be work and it might just be production. But it's so easy if you just take a few moments for that spiritual aspect of gardening to develop. And and I find more and more last week I was talking about the, the birds and just how fantastic it was to me to see something new in the garden. After all these years I garden, I still see something new all the time that nature throws out at me. And I think that's that's just a fantastic way to approach it. Paul's wondering, any benefit to fully prepping beds in fall versus spring? Yes, I think so. In fact, um, I have a, a number of videos. I did one just about a year ago uh, that shows how I amend my beds in fall. And that's my preferred method. Now, I have a really long winter and my ground is frozen in the bed. So there's not a lot happening in my winter. But by prepping the beds in fall, adding all the organic matter in, 
that organic matter begins to break down. It adds the nutrients to the soil. And then when, when winter sets in, most of that activity is going to stop, depending on how cold your winters are. But then as soon as things warm up in spring, all that food is there in the soil. All those, those, those nutrients are, are reinvigorated as the microbes come back to life as the soil warms up in spring. And they continue to decompose and they continue to enrich the soil so that by the time you put plants in those beds in spring, that soil has potentially five, six, or seven months of life building activity that has taken place. And so now those plants in spring have just about everything they need. And I, I showed my garden in last week's live stream, no fertilization at all in any of my beds this year. My plants look beautiful and it was all with my fall, autumn preparation of the soil that enabled those plants to start off so well and grow so well in the spring. So you can definitely amend in spring. And so if it's a choice of amending in spring or not amending at all, I say amend in spring as early as possible. So you can really give those microbes time to get that soil prepared for the plants. But for me, I, I definitely think there's an advantage to, to the fall prep. And that really is my, my preferred way to do it. Shandy's Garden says, we all garden to learn. My biggest takeaway was patience. Very good. It's just a bonus that we meet new people in our town and friends have started to come to me when they have questions. That's awesome. Yes, patience. <laughs> patience is a virtue, but it's also a necessity, I think, when it comes to gardening. So that's fantastic. Riverdale Gardens, hardening off broccoli, cauliflower, and kohlrabi as we speak. Awesome. I'll be planting them out for fall in a couple days. That is absolutely wonderful, River and Dale. We've talked about that in recent weeks, so that means you started your broccoli and your cauliflower and your kohlrabi indoors during the heat of summer. And now as we roll into the fall, you're going to transplant. That's an outstanding idea. Which is another reason, I think, for why we can garden. Is It, it, it really helps all of us develop those skills for planning like planning ahead like like riverdale gardens is doing the 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 look forward to what's going to happen in our garden and what needs to take place to get to that point and i i think there's so many lessons in gardening that we can transfer to everyday life the planning we do in our garden you just as easily transfer to planning your day-to-day -day activities to make sure everything is going as well as it should be. So that's really good. <coughs> Dora Sim, good morning to you. Been away a while. Nice to see you back. Moving 10 hours away and starting new takes lots of time. Gardening is going good. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Christine says fall prep allows for seeds that generated from the year before and drop to germinate in the fall again. Yes, absolutely. Ivan is saying, been acclimating my fall plants. Now they're going in the ground. Good for you. Can't wait to see what the cooler temperatures will bring. That's fantastic. It, yeah. <coughs> so take a second, depending on how long you've been gardening, and think back to when you started and what the reason was that you started and, and how long it took for that reason to change or to modify or for you to add on to that reason. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that start with house plants and then move outside or vice versa. They start outside and then move in and start learning more about house plants. It's all gardening, two different types of gardening, but the reasons may be different why you do one from the other. And as you recognize the reason behind why you garden, I think it can really help you identify what more you need to learn, what the extra expectations would be, what the, the things are that you haven't done yet that you might want to consider doing. And that's why I say I, I really do think it's an evolution. 
for me right now it's the teaching aspect it's the filming it's choosing plants choosing beds doing things with the focus on gardening now i still garden for food i still garden for the enjoyment i still garden just because i love learning about things that i don't know i love getting out with nature i love that focus on having to develop the patience i love getting out and being active all of those are reasons why i've focused on doing certain things in my garden in my journey right now primary focus is education me educating others who want to see what i'm doing i expect i'm planning that in the next year or two that focus is going to change because as i finish building out my garden I'll be able to take more time to sit and relax and enjoy and just be part of nature. So it's okay to evolve and it's okay to plan for that evolution and actually look forward to the reasons changing. <coughs> Hot Pepper Paul says, I planted from seeds today, collards, mustard greens, radishes, kale, katazuna, and tatsoi. Awesome. I actually have some seeds like that that I'm putting in today to include the mustard greens and the collards. Later today, I'll start a couple of types of cukes and put nets over them this time of year to stop the pickle worm. Great idea. <coughs> and so uh, that, that's a really good idea. I talked about that in a video a year or two ago. I, I use covers over my seeds and seedlings in summer more than I use covers over my plants in spring. And a big reason for that is because of those insect pests. They might be more active in the summer. And so I do the same thing. When I start my seeds, I, I cover them to help keep some, some of those pests out and stop the life cycle from continuing as far as those pests are in the garden. So good for you. Gail saying, I started gardening with my mom very young. Now I do it for peace of mind. Awesome. And reflecting on life and remembering my mom. That's fantastic. And that, that's a wonderful reason. I, I, I hope you have, and if you haven't thought about it, Gail, have, have a section of your garden or multiple sections of your garden. This is the way I try to approach it. That are those memory gardens where you've got your vegetable garden for food production and you've got your food forest and you have your pollinator garden. Well, go ahead and have your memory garden. Go ahead and have an area and, and I'm, I haven't fully developed mine yet, but, but I remember some of the flowers that my grandmother grew. And I remember some of the flowers at some of the houses we lived at when I was young. And so I'm planning sections in my garden that will evoke those memories because those flowers will be there blooming at different times, but I'll have a bench or a seed of some type and and it'll be a spot I can just go sit and and relive some of those those happy times with with the family who may not be be here anymore. So great idea. Great idea. Gardens Happen says for future videos, I'm working on making a mobility garden for those who can't stand or lift heavy objects and a touch garden for the blind and autistic. Fantastic. I some of my older videos when I was still at the Galileo Garden. I talk about some of that. Uh, in fact, my my video when I when I left the Galileo Garden, I talk about some of that as well. That that's a really good point. When I was at the school, that was one of the reasons that I was gardening, because we had the the special needs students at our school, and I built a sensory garden that I was extremely proud of, with those students in mind. And they, came, they literally came out to the garden every single day to spend time in the sensory garden for those, those kids that were on the autism spectrum. So great idea. I also had an entire section of the garden, and I show this in one of those earlier videos, where the beds were spaced high enough and far enough apart so that the students in wheelchairs could actually garden. So that's fantastic that you're doing that. And, and it does take extra planning and extra work, but the benefits just can't be 
expressed well enough. The, the kids, when they get out to the garden, especially those kids who might not normally have access to a garden, it's just absolutely fantastic. So good for you. Good for you. I look forward to, to seeing that video and hearing more about what you're doing because it really is good. Rachel's Nana always grew buttercups. There you go. That's, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Have a reason for why you garden. And it's your own reason. And it can be as in-depth or as light as possible. But I hope you're growing buttercup, buttercups. Or if you haven't, you've started to think about growing the buttercups. Urban Chicken Mama is going to be 94 for only one day this week. Do I go to all the shade cloth trouble for just a day and my peppers and tomatoes? <coughs> I, I don't think it's necessary for just one day. Uh, and chances are it's late enough in the season that the fruit is already set. The, the issue that you have when the temperature gets above 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius, is that the pollination is affected. That the, the flowers either might not be pollinated or the blossoms might drop because it's too hot. But usually just one day of extreme heat is not going to result in a big difference with your plants or in your garden. You can, but for the most part, the, the plants should be big enough now that they're going to be shading themselves. And so particularly on the peppers and the tomatoes, those, those top of the plants where the new flowers are developing, yeah, some of those new flowers might be affected in the heat as far as the pollination is concerned, but the rest of the plant will be fine. I would suggest watering in the morning, making sure the soil is nice and moist as as you enter the heat of the day. Uh, but but I I don't go to that much extra trouble when I notice that there's just a day or or two even of those high temperatures. Tammy says I have a bit of a mess around and I find out gardening style. I probably don't have enough time to grow cabbage, but I threw seeds in this weekend anyway. We shall see what I get. Isn't that it, you know, that's a, that's another great reason for why I garden as well, is to do that. Just throw some seeds in and see what happens. I grew up in, in Reno, Nevada, where my, my parents worked in the casinos. I know all about gambling. I know all about probability. I don't gamble because I know about probability. But my whole life has been built around gambling, so to speak. And... I think gardening is one of the best ways to gamble. Rather than sticking your, your coins into a slot machine, throw some seeds out in your garden. Make some hybrids of your own. Allow your squash to cross-pollinate and then save the seeds. Gamble in your garden. I love that. I love trying new things and then just seeing what happens and see what you'll get. So I think that's fantastic. It's a really good idea uh, to, to approach gardening. Just do it and then see what happens. So SJK, thank you. I appreciate that. Yogi Lai is talking to Urban Chicken Mama. I was just thinking the same, but this is my first year using shade. My plants have been fine in the past. I think it's multiple hot days that hurt them or over 100 degrees. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would second that motion as well. Uh, a day or two where it gets really hot, it's one of those things that uh, the, the plants can handle it. it. It's those long stretches during the peak of summer where it really becomes a problem. Ivan says it needs to be mandatory in schools to have gardens. Soon it will be so. I certainly hope so. What, what I've found, I've, I have helped start eight school gardens. And I've worked with a number of other gardens, school gardens that were already in place. And in every case, it comes down to how the school sets up the garden. Most of the time, it's one teacher who has that passion. And the teacher does all of the work to get it started, seeks the grants, gets the donations, teaches the kids, and sets up the school garden. And then when that teacher leaves, the whole thing fades. And I've seen so many, you probably have as to community gardens and school gardens that just fail because of that one person who left. Whenever I went to a school to start a school garden, I started with that. 
saying if you have one person and I would usually say ask who the person was if it's only one person who's behind this project you can expect that it's going to fail for the project to be successful you need a group and you need a long-term plan and and the the best school garden that I've been associated with that's the way they approached it the the head of the PTA was working with the principal and working with a primary teacher and the three of them approached me and I met with the three and the four of us developed a plan for the long term and it, and it became you know sometimes gardening by committee may not sound like a good idea but it really is in a school you need to have the different tasks assigned to different people so that it's spread out and if one person leaves it's no big deal there's a whole bunch of people left behind to carry on the activity that's the biggest problem I see in school gardens and a big reason why we don't have them in every school I'd love to have them in every school in Denver the Denver public school system actually encourages a school garden in every school and they actually have budget to support school gardens in every school but it probably comes as no surprise that every school in Denver Colorado does not have a garden because you've got to have the people behind it to make it happen you can have the support you can have the money but you got to have the people at the school to really make it come to fruition literally so <laughs> completely agree with you I, I would love to see a, a model where we could have that in every school it's an uphill battle but anything you can do to help with a school in your area if there's a school garden that you're aware of volunteer help share your knowledge if if you're talking with someone and they express the interest in starting a, a school garden help them out share your time it's those kinds of things that, that really make a difference <clears throat> okay let's see Christine says nothing better <coughs> than to have your grandkids smile beaming and enjoying picking blueberries right off the bushes into the containers they love to eat absolutely fantastic and I've said that many times that's that's a big reason why I garden for myself is to give my grandkids out there are things I'm growing not to make a video about not because I particularly think it needs to be there but because it's something it's like the, the sweet peas the snap peas I grow snap peas almost throughout the season so whenever my grandkids come to the garden they can pick the pea pea pods off the plant and eat them right there and eat the raspberries and eat the strawberries and everything else so I completely agree with you Chris Christine there is nothing better than that when it comes to the garden and sharing it with kids or grandkids I think it's one of those things that uh, yeah it keeps me going there are there are the beds I have that are I'm growing for my grandkids I have to admit they get better care than some of the other beds in my garden because I want to make sure that they're going to be alive and growing and producing when my grandkids and my daughter of course come to the garden it is one of those kind of things that um, <clears throat> it it takes time and it takes that focus but when you've got that reason to do it, it it makes it all worthwhile mornings at the allotment I started a new job last summer and brought surplus harvest for my colleagues good for you this year we've started a small garden at the office awesome and I have three of them growing at home as well success exclamation point completely agree good for you that's fantastic there there's another reason why to garden so that you can share it you know when when asked a question why do you garden it doesn't have to be at your garden and that's why I say you have multiple reasons at your own home garden the reason you garden may be one way at the office it's okay and actually expect for it to be something different another reason and sharing that information and that passion is fantastic so good for you I, I'm so glad to see that <coughs> okay let's see uh 
Irvin Chickamama says we have several community gardens in the town. That's fantastic. We used to, and, and again, this is one of those things. So I've, I've mentioned my, my gardener buddy, Larry, a, a few times over in the past few years. Larry was the, 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 the creator, the initiator, the developer of Pikes Peak Urban Gardens here in Colorado Springs. And that was about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now. Fantastic guy, master gardener certified, just fantastic at getting grants and getting partnerships with, with businesses all around town, getting property donated so that they could start community gardens. And he, he started community gardens all over the city of Colorado Springs and very successful. He's about my age, actually 10 years older than me, and he retired a few years back kind of like the school garden you have to have the, the entire process you have to have all the people in place and even though he had a nonprofit set up to continue his replacement didn't have the same skills and didn't have the same passion and within a year they were bankrupt they ceased to exist and a lot of those community gardens have failed and are being reclaimed by neighborhoods for other purposes and it's it's just so sad to see and so if if you're not involved getting involved with community gardens uh, and school gardens as well can help some of them when they get into those hard situations where they need extra help because it because it's a lot of work Jay Dixon, why do I garden number four? To share my experience, knowledge, and supplies with local gardeners. Good for you. Yeah, I haven't really talked about the, the supply aspect of it as well. Those of us that have been gardening for a while have tools. We have those things you need to garden. And great idea, great reason to do it because sometimes those are limiting factors for other gardeners. And by sharing, you can make it happen for somebody else. So good for you, Jay. I like that idea. I think that's one of those things that um, uh, if if we do it, if we share our time and our tools and our knowledge with someone else, then it's so much easier for that person to pass it on, for them to share their experience and their tools and their knowledge as they become more experienced. So I think. I think that's really a good way to consider um, the journey that it's, you're not alone. You're learning from others, but but you can also share with others. Gardens Happen says a dream of mine is to get several acres of land to make a large garden and donate extra food for those who need it. That's fantastic. That they used to, uh, or I used to see more information about grow a row for hunger. I haven't seen anything about that in quite a while but the idea being that yes in one of your beds one of your rows or as much space as you could uh, afford to give away grow food for those in need and depending on what it is i, I worked a lot with the care and share food bank here in colorado springs because i i did a lot of that too when i was growing at the school was to donate a thousand pounds plus each year to families in need and not everything you grow can actually be used by some of the food banks so uh, check with them ahead of time so you know exactly what they want but that's that's a great aspiration that's really a, a good thing to 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 look for so i think that's awesome okay let's see i'm trying to catch up a little bit um, so Britt Lee says, <clears throat> what's your suggested first step to start community gardens like your friend did? So the first step is to find out if there's an organization that will assist you. And so like up in Denver, there's an organization, Denver Urban Gardens. And in Colorado Springs, it doesn't exist anymore, but there was Pikes Peak Urban Gardens. And so your city may have an organization that is actually designed to help get a community garden started and and it's as simple as just contacting them and you know maybe just a, a simple search just do um whatever your town is urban garden and search that or uh community gardens 
with whatever your town happens to be. And you might be surprised that something will pop up that, to give you the help. <clears throat> Beyond that, start talking with other gardeners and with friends and to see what interest there is to do it in the first place. I'm aware of a couple uh, community gardens in Denver that started off with the community in full support and they lasted for 10 years or so, but then the neighborhood changed and the people moving in were younger and they wanted playground equipment in that space rather than gardens in that space. There's a whole nother issue of discussion that we won't get into today. But but you need that community to support. You need them to, to recognize whether a community garden is even desired in that particular community. And then you start putting the group together. You start putting the committee at work to, to start laying out a plan, hopefully with assistance of an organization who's done it before. If it's not a community garden, maybe somebody at a school garden can give you help in what you need to do to get started. And then, ideally, you can find someone who knows how to, to write grant proposals because there are hundreds of organizations that will give you money for projects like that. You just have to fill out the grant proposal and request the money. And that's that's a whole nother world. So you need to you need to learn how to do that. Then it's helpful to have somebody that can walk up to a business owner and ask for free supplies or at least a big discount on the supplies. Put all of those things together and you can get started. It's, it's more than just taking your shovel and digging out a bed. You really have to have that support structure and the supplies. In, in my area, water is a commodity. And that was a big part of what they had to figure out was where they were going to get the water and who was going to pay for it. It can be a big deal. A big community garden can use a lot of water. Who's going to pay for that water? And if it isn't already there, who's going to pay for utilities to run a water line to the garden? So you can see why we don't do more community gardens and school gardens, because there's a lot to it. But the, the more people involved, the more likely it is that you'll, do, you'll have some people with those skills. And then you can start laying your plan out and then you can start moving forward. So I don't mean to dissuade you, but, but there is a lot of work involved to get started beyond just the idea phase. Okay, let's see, scrolling down. Heidi says, I always say that it is not great if my gardening knowledge is just limited to me. That's fantastic. I, I completely agree. I like that, Heidi. That's a good way to say it. Knowledge, knowledge is a good thing. Absolutely. But I, I completely agree. Knowledge really isn't as beneficial if you just keep it to yourself. So by all means, share it. Lisa, hide back to you. No problem being out in the garden. Forgot the fave show. You're back. You're here. You can always catch up. So I think that's fantastic that, that you've rushed in from your gardening. Mary says, I started gardening to remember childhood with grandmother. Awesome. I, I learned quickly why she had a garden. She had a hard life and the garden has a way to ease daily stresses. Yes, absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad that's a, a big reason for why you started gardening and that's a good way. And I imagine, <clears throat> especially when you when you start gardening with a memory in mind, how often, and you may not even acknowledge it or recognize it, but how many times are you in the garden and those memories pop up without, without you even thinking that you just had that memory pop up. I'm guessing they pop up all the time. And so it's one of those things. And, and I'll talk about that here at the end today. But uh, yeah, strive to, to recreate and to remember some of those things that, that are joyful in your life. And then make those new memories for yourself for the future. Okay, Jay Dixon, I know I'm missing some of these. Why do I garden number six? To have a practical project for self-development, peace, and satisfaction. Absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to have to <coughs> catch up afterwards and see what all of your reasonings 
or what all your reasons are. So thanks, Jay. Terry says, I want to spray my plants with a fertilizer. Is it okay to do it when there are flowers or fruit on the plants? Also, can I spray in the evening? Temperatures are still in the 90s. <clears throat> so first off, if you haven't seen the video that I just did about a week ago on foliar feeding, go ahead and watch that first. You might question whether you even need to fertilize your plants by spraying because I'm still a huge advocate of fertilizing the soil if the soil needs fertilizer. And as I said a little while ago, my soil doesn't need fertilizer because I've grown good soil. So there might be better ways to fertilize your plants than spraying them. But to your questions, yes, it, it is okay to, to spray plants with flowers and fruit on them. The fertilizer isn't going to make the fruit taste different. It's not going to make the flowers do something funky. It's possible, depending on the fertilizer and how much you apply, that it could cause the blossom to drop or not pollinate. But that's not that big of a problem. And and many plants, if they are, if the soil is deficient and they need fertilizer as they're beginning to fruit, then foliar feeding can be a quick boost of nutrients to the plant. And so giving that quick boost of nutrients when they're flowering and beginning to fruit can be a good idea if you know that the soil is deficient in those nutrients. As far as the temperatures, I, I would do it in the evening. Yeah, it's not so much that, that you shouldn't do it when it's hot. You should try to avoid doing it in the heat when everything you spray is going to evaporate if you do it at noon underneath the full sun. Do it when temperatures begin to cool in the evening so that those fertilizers rest on the leaves and can be absorbed by the, the cell structure of the plant and then they'll, they'll be absorbed over the course of the evening. So that would be the way I would approach it uh, if you, you know, probably don't have any control over the temperature, but you can have control over whether you're doing it in full sun or not. So hope that helps. But yeah, check out that video from uh, from last week and, and, and there's more information about it in that one. And maybe that'll help you out as well. Okay, Danica, wonderful to meet you. We just started Dirty Dog Farm and really appreciate all of your knowledge. We have a channel showing mostly our fails since we're new. Thanks for sharing with us. Awesome. <clears throat> and so I was going to do it next week, but I've got a different live stream planned for next week. But the following week, I'm planning on actually highlighting the the some of the new channels that are popping up, some of the, the, the small channels, some of you who have been following Gardener's Cup for years and are just now starting a channel. And so nice to have you here, Danica and Dirty Dog Farm. And so uh, please... Over the course of the next couple weeks, if you have a brand new channel or a small channel or just want to, to share with us the videos that you've made, let me know in the comments and I'll be, I'll be highlighting uh, as many as I can in the weeks ahead. So I'm glad I can help you out, Danica, and I look forward. I'll check out some of your videos and, and uh, look forward to all of that. Jay says, <laughs> number seven to have a reliable source of a range of nutritious produce to preserve by canning, pickling, dehydrating, and freezing. Fantastic idea. That's, actually, I didn't mention that in the beginning. That's a big reason why I garden. Uh, I was planning on <laughs> taking a lot of the zucchini and the squash I had and preserving it, but I've got so many people asking for the produce, I gave it all away. So one of these next batches, that's why I'm growing so much of, of what I do. That's why I'm growing so many tomatoes and so many peppers and so many cucumbers and so many squashes is for preservation. It's so that I can make the pickles, so that I can freeze them, so I can dry them, so I can do all the different things I do. So fantastic reason. And I've said this before, that learning how to preserve your harvest in many ways is as important if maybe not more important than the actual act of the growing itself. So good reason, Jay. Good good reason to garden, absolutely. Uh, another reason that I hadn't really <coughs> talked about either was 
um, the uniqueness, growing some of those things that you can't buy in the store. Some of those, those varieties that you see in a catalog or you come across a seed packet, the experimentation is part of it, but also to try something new and a new taste, a, a new flavor of something that you've never experienced before. I'm growing gooseberries. I've never eaten a gooseberry before, but I'm growing gooseberry for the purpose of eating gooseberries. I may not like them, we'll see, but, but that's a reason why I garden as well, is that, that, that experience and those new things. And so that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful way to approach it. Coastal Gardens Northwest, I have issues with rats eating all my carrots. Any suggestions how to prevent them getting to them? <coughs> so so it, it, it actually can be relatively easy. Carrots do not need to be exposed to open air. They don't need to be pollinated. And this holds true for lettuce and spinach and so many of the other root crops. The beetroots and, and the Swiss chard and the turnips, all of those kind of plants, they don't need to be pollinated for us to harvest them. That means that you can fully enclose that garden bed. And the easiest way I find to do it is to put hoops over the plants and then to cover the bed with row cover fabric. Just a very light fabric that sun can still get through, water can still get through, but animals can't get through. And so you cover the hoops with the row cover fabric and then you weight down or staple down the edges so that the rats can't get in and you've just created a barrier and and you really don't need to <coughs> excuse me you don't need to have access to your plants on a daily basis they can absorb the sun they can absorb the water it's okay for some weeds to grow put mulch down to help out with that and then when you do need to care for the plants just lift up one side of that row cover reach underneath do whatever you need to do with the plants or harvest the carrots and then cover it all back up again so um, i i had some issues like that uh, with squirrels in the past and with rabbits in the past and some of my in-ground beds and that's the most effective way just cover them so that those animals can't get to them and hopefully you'll see that that can actually have some pretty good success and uh, and continue moving on into the future and and the same with insect pests if if you have a big problem with a particular uh squash bug or cucumber beetle or whatever it happens to be you can do the same thing you can put covers over your plants so that those pests can't get to your plants during that critical part of their life cycle where they need to get to the plant and lay eggs and then a year later you don't have those pests anymore because you were able to break the life cycle okay let's see Erla saying spotted lantern fly is an invasive from china the recommendation is to squish. Penn State Extension has info about it. Oh, I guess someone was asking a question about spotted lanternfly. So, yeah, there's a lot of fact sheets you can find on Extension. So thank you for that, Carla. Thank you for sharing that information. <coughs> Heather says, I garden have fresh produce that's chemical-free. Another great reason. I built raised beds in 2016 for my back, but now rotted out. Bought two Ollie's beds so far. We'll put them together this fall after the last harvest. Cool. Yeah, that, that another great reason. And another great reason of, of how you garden. That's why I have my raised beds as well, because my back. So not only why do you garden, but how have you chosen to garden to make sure that that why is taken care of? So good for you. Yeah, chemical-free. Uh, that, that's the approach I took at the school garden with the students and all the kids is we were beyond chemical free. I mean, it, it was, it, it, you can be organic and still use chemicals. We used no chemicals of any type in our gardens and had wonderful gardens. So that was a big reason why I gardened that way at the school garden was because we had kids who might have sensitivities to some of those chemicals, but also to teach 
that you could do something like gardening without relying on the fertilizers and the pesticides and the herbicides and all the other things that we want to douse on our plants. With planning and with work, I mean, it doesn't happen overnight, but you can definitely have a chemical-free garden. So good for you. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Thanks, Jay. For, Jay's always on top of things. Jay and Heidi are just the fantastic moderators. Thanks for sharing Dirty Dog Farms information with everybody today. So, how I win the lottery. said, I covered my strawberries with the homemade screen. Check out my video garden tour. It may help with your carrots. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that as well. Uh, yeah, the uh, had the deer munch on one of my strawberry beds again. And so, I think I'll check out that video as well because... I've been trying different types of netting over my strawberries and a screen, a netting, uh, a row cover fabric, anything that can keep the pests that you're trying to deter off of your plants. That's that's a good approach that you want to take. So, OK, um, <coughs> so an another another thing that I would suggest that you do in addition to asking yourself, why do I garden? is to ask others. And you know that's why I posed the question early on of all of you. When you meet new gardeners, when you have time to, to mingle with your gardener friends, ask them why they garden. I've, I've actually learned from other gardeners reasons to garden, things that I may not have thought about. So while I was focused on just learning stuff and experimenting and my own food and all the other reasons I've already given. That's one of the reasons why I now try some of these things that I've never experienced before from talking to other gardeners. Why do you garden? Oh, I just love to try things I've never tried before. Well, yeah, that's a great reason. I think I'll do that too. And so I'm trying to share as many ideas as I can. I know others are as well. And so ask others why they garden and they'll probably surprise you. A lot of the reasons are the same, but occasionally you'll come up with that new reason that you can add to your repertoire and choose as a reason for you to continue growing as you move forward. Paul says, I discovered a weed growing around my herb garden. It turned out to be a bicolor Japanese mint. I didn't plant it. I have no idea where it came from. So now I'll dig it up and give it a good home. Awesome. Awesome. That's a fantastic, uh, fantastic story to share. Thank you. I, I have something, it looks like a coleus, but I have a plant that, that just popped up in one of my pots. And so I potted up raspberries. I showed that in a, an earlier video. Not all of the, the raspberries took. Those pots are still resting off to the side. And now I have this plant growing in one of them and it's beautiful. And so I'm doing the same thing. It's like, why do I garden? Because there's so many things that pop up that you don't ever notice until you start gardening. And then it becomes just a highlight of the season when you discover something like a bicolor Japanese mint. So I think that's fantastic. <coughs> okay, let's see. Bohemian Herbology Natural Solution says heirloom tomatoes, $3.99 a pound. Peppers, $2, not even organic or as good as mine. And yours are, of course, free and organic. Absolutely. I'm, I've got a video planned uh, later in the season when I tally up all of the harvests that I've done with that thought in mind of just how much money I was able to save this year by growing my own crops for free and not having to spend anything at the store and absolutely better tasting and better for you than anything else that you can find. Wow, Jay's already up to number 12. <laughs> That's great. To experience simple childlike delight on a daily basis. I love that. Absolutely. I I that's I love that. Yeah, there are days that that I come in feeling giddy just like a kid because I just spent 20 minutes watching a bumblebee in a flower. That, that's a great reason to, to be out there. And Marie, hello to you in Finland. It's been a while. The summer has kept me busy. Well, it's glad to see you back. And it's evening for you. And nice to have you here. We've 
we've all had a busy summer, those of us that are actively growing right now. And so I'm glad you were able to break away and join us. That's absolutely fantastic. And Chris, love to the chat. Love back to you. That's fantastic. <coughs> Shandy's Garden says, I go to the local greenhouse or garden center if I just need a boost. You know, I do that too. Um, and I don't often talk about that, but but I, I'll do that at, at greenhouses or nurseries or gardens around town. If I find that I happen to be in an area where there's plants and I have a few minutes, yeah, it doesn't have to be my garden that gives me that boost like you. Sometimes just being around plants. Of course, I usually end up going home with some plants I didn't plan on buying when I go to the nursery. But I, I like that idea. I think that's one of those things that you can definitely benefit from. Rudimental Gardening says, I enjoy teaching others what I've learned about gardening and listening to others about their experiences. Yes, definitely a two-way experience. Always something to learn, hoping to get a local high school to start a garden. Fantastic. <coughs> the, the biggest issue I had with the school garden wasn't that I didn't have support from the staff. The principal gave me all the support I needed and support from the teachers. They all loved the produce that, that I brought to the school lunches every day. The, our, our school had the fresh produce from our garden on their menu uh, throughout the harvest season. But the biggest issue I had was actually getting it as part of the syllabus, as part of the, the daily class schedule. And when I first started, we actually had a teacher at the, at the school that I built, the, the school garden, that was teaching gardening-related activities as part of the science uh, department. And we, we were teaching botany, how plants grow, and then they would go out to the garden for hands-on learning. But that class, that teacher moved to a different class, a different department. And once that class went away, there was nowhere in the curricula of the whole school where gardening fit. And then we had a new school superintendent that came in and instituted the same curricula across the entire school district with the idea being that, that if you moved, you could go from one school to another school and be able to pick up without losing anything. Problem is, school gardens weren't built into that plan. And so <clears throat> when starting a school garden, in addition to putting the committee and everything together, try to figure out how you can incorporate it into the studies of the school so that the students can come out and make it part of the class day as opposed to just extra activity because so many schools don't want those extras anymore it really has to be incorporated and you and you can incorporate it in just about any aspect of school i had a a math teacher that had uh, a free period it was towards the end of the year and the studies were done and the testing was done and she asked to bring her class out to the school garden they came out and she'd been teaching, the, well, she'd been teaching at the school for a number of years. The garden had already been in place for two years, and that was the first time she had brought students out to the garden. And she, she told me, she said, I love this space. I'm so glad I came out today. I had no idea this was so fantastic. And then she made a statement that just floored me. She said, I, I, I would have come out and brought students sooner, but I just can't see how I could incorporate gardening into math. My, my brain almost exploded. And so I then spent about 20 minutes telling her how math is such a critical part of gardening and how you can have practical application. And then I demonstrated it with her and her kids to, to choose a bed and, and, and showed them length times width times height, and you can figure the volume of the soil within a raised bed. She came back a week later and let me know that that one day in the garden was more beneficial for some of those students in learning math principles than she'd spent in the last two weeks. Sadly, 
That was the last time she ever came to the garden. She recognized the importance of it, but the curricula did not allow her to have the flexibility to actually come out to the garden and put it to practical use. So I love the idea of starting school gardens everywhere, but that's a big part of it. It doesn't do a lot of good if you can't get the students into the garden in the first place. <clears throat> Idaho Gardener says, I just want to say thank you for your work and great videos. Well, you're very welcome. You are the reason I started gardening last year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow. I hadn't even ever thought about that. But yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, if the why behind you gardening is because somebody else is doing it or you see somebody else doing it, great reason to start. Now it's time to develop all those other reasons for you to continue gardening and sharing your expertise as you develop it. So fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Frank says gardening to me is like conducting a symphony orchestra. Every plant is an instrument that makes its own music. I like that. <coughs> and not only is it like conducting a symphony orchestra, but it might be like conducting a symphony orchestra in an outdoor amphitheater because you also have to conduct all those plans with the weather and all of those other factors that come into play but absolutely every plant makes its own music and and when it's by itself the music of a plant is beautiful but when you put it all together oh, absolutely it, it it's a symphony I, I love that so let's go ahead and because that ties in with the background today. So this comes from Brian Siebert. And this is a relatively recent photo of Brian's garden. And I, I think this looks like a symphony with everything happening. So um, directly behind me is an arch. And you can see these birdhouse gourds growing on this side. And over here, you can see, I think these are the loofah gourds. Look how beautiful those are hanging down in, into the archway. On either side, you've got flowers. You've got cherry tomatoes growing up this trellis. And as I move to the side, you can see it actually extends back quite a ways. And beautiful garden. Green, lush. The plants look wonderful. You can see some of the, the the herbs growing along the way as well. And some of the looks like wood chip mulching in the background. <coughs> Absolutely. You are a conductor putting all of the pieces together to make the symphony sing and play its beautiful music. And so uh, I, I really like this picture from from Brian's garden because it does show uh, the beauty of, and the music of the garden and all the the pieces growing and you can you can see a few things i, I really like this trellis you've got the the sturdy trellis right here you can see the other end right here you've got the top piece and then of course you've got all the supports that'll be uh, dropping down to to anchor and support the tomatoes as they grow up this it looks like this plant right here it almost looks like a cardinal flower <coughs> but the the pollinators to attract or the the flowers to attract the pollinators the the fruit that's growing the the, the greenery the design so you can just walk through this archway and pluck and harvest all of those gourds once they're fully developed it it, it does it just sings to to a gardener to to see a scene like this and and to see what the conductor has accomplished so thank you brian for sharing this picture with us today uh, i think it really is beautiful and uh, and as well thank you for the idea of the conductor and the symphony bun for bun thank you for that super chat donation i really appreciate it <clears throat> seeing birds bees and wildlife on a summer day with a glass of lemonade oh that sounds really good that is reason enough i completely agree the raspberries and strawberries are a bonus and i'm guessing you're putting some of those raspberries and strawberries into the lemonade 
which which is even more of a bonus because it, it just tastes so awesome so thank you for that absolutely absolutely just just all of the work all of the planning all of the effort that it takes and all of those days when we're hot and sweaty and tired and sore and, and sometimes we do question ourselves if it's all worth it i agree with you seeing the birds and the bees and the wildlife with a glass of lemonade it makes it all worth it just that single moment just that one little bit just that one memory absolutely makes it all worthwhile and and there have been so many of those moments for me where i was sitting in the garden and i saw that thing i heard that bird what it, i smelled that fragrance oh my lilacs were just incredible this year and and I, I actually had the thought if it all ended right now this would be how i wanted to go in the garden what a great way to have led your life to have that moment be a moment that if it's your last moment you're completely satisfied with your life but more importantly if it's not your last moment it's yet another wonderful memory that you can add to your list of those many other memories that all took place in the garden. That's a big reason why I do it. It's creating those memories and reliving those memories as I'm out in the garden. <clears throat> Betty says, have a volunteer pumpkin growing. It's turned into a monster. I let it have free reign. It's just about taking over. I like that idea. I, I've let that happen many, many times. I'm a live and let live kind of gardener. I've said that before. Now, I will kill plants when they need to be killed, and I'll thin out when I need to thin out. But if there's a monster pumpkin growing in a place I didn't put it, and it's got space to grow, I let it grow. Yeah, it it it, it deserves a place in, in my garden as much as I deserve a place in the garden. So that's, that's a good way to approach it. Rachel says, my garden has helped me appreciate the beauty in the world around me. That's fantastic. I notice so much around me now. Yes, it's literally an eye-opening experience. It's noticing that one thing that one day and the recognition that those things are all around you all you have to do is open your eyes and you see them all the time so that's that's good rachel thank you for sharing that <coughs> and gardens happen says have a volunteer sweet potato vine that's growing i've, I've got some uh, some flowers that are popping up all over that that i didn't put in i, I like that um the 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 sweet potatoes i'm growing on purpose but yeah, that's one of those things. If you make your own compost and then use that compost in your beds, the the best tasting melon, the best tasting muskmelon cantaloupe that I've ever had was a volunteer plant. And it had to have come from the, the seeds from a cantaloupe the year before. And I composted all of that the the skin that i cut off and all those seeds put it in the compost used the compost in the beds and then the next year i had a volunteer melon plant only one cantaloupe grew on that plant oh, it was fantastic it, it was incredibly tasteful it just was so good that i've tried growing cantaloupe since and it it doesn't match it and that's a big reason why I let plants grow, because if they can reach that point of harvest, it may be one of those memories, one of those experiences that you will remember for the rest of your gardening journey. Fat melon certainly was, and it was one of the things that didn't even ask for, didn't even look for, but I saw it and I let it happen. And... I love that memory. That was such a fantastic melon. I wish I could recreate that. James says, my one and a half year old has started helping me water. Fantastic. It's a nice daily adventure we get to do together. Oh, I like that idea. There's reason to garden as well, to pass it on to another generation. So I hope you're 
one and a half year old sticks with it, I'm sure you will definitely be a, a good example. I, my kids were a little older than that when I first started gardening. My kids are in their mid thirties now and I've been gardening for about 30 years. So they were a little bit older involved with school and everything else. And I didn't know back then as I was learning to garden that what I should have been doing was allowing my kids to learn with me as I was learning. And so get the kids out there as early as possible. Because by the time I kind of knew what I was doing and actually had a garden that I could grow in full time, now my kids were teenagers, the last thing they wanted to do was get out and help their old man in the garden. As, as I said earlier, they're coming around. They've got kids of their own. My grandkids, along with my daughter's help, are, are getting into gardening. And my two-year-old grandson, with my son's help, are starting to talk about maybe having a garden. I think that's fantastic. It, it's better late than never. But to start early, one and a half, help them or allow them to help you watering, more power to you. I think that is a fantastic, awesome way to approach it. <clears throat> Jackie says, I'm thankful for this channel. I now have three raised beds and enjoying the learning process. Well, good for you, Jackie. I'm glad that we can all help out. This is just a fantastic group, not just me, but all the rest of us. So that's that's fantastic. And I'm glad. So it's three now. And now's the point. All of us do it when you start expanding even more so next year do you add another bed do you add some more containers do you start growing in pots you've got the buck so now start learning more and start expanding what you're doing that's one of the things i garden as well is just to see what more i can do all those new beds all those new things how big i can make my garden it gets crazy it can get out of control but it is definitely one of those things that is fun Nick from Yuma says, my family likes hanging out around the garden, but no one does any work. You know, and, and like I said, with my kids, especially when they were when they were teenagers, I just accepted that. And I knew that they enjoyed some of the fresh produce. My daughter loved my pickled green beans. I've talked about that before. I knew they liked hanging out in the garden. I knew they liked walking out there with the dogs, but they didn't help. And, and they actually had some bad memories of the times when we were digging out rocks to create garden beds those are actually bad memories for all of us but it led to a lot of learning and a lot of experience and even those bad memories can help form a foundation for what comes in the future because it's the good memories that now become even better when you have some of those bad things to share so as long as they're enjoying it one way or another they might come around they might find a way to help you in the future i think that's one of those things that uh They'll, they'll figure it out on their own schedule, in their own time, and then you can garden together. Tina says, gardening allows me to intimately get in touch with Gaia. Oh, absolutely. The grounding effects are unmatched. And, and so I'm planning a video. Um, it'll come out in just over a month where I'll be talking about that. The, the, the actual science behind gardening and Gaia and the earth and and the connections that gardeners can develop to to nature and, and to include the improvements in health by just sticking your hands in the soil it's just incredible and and there really is scientific research to support it so uh, I, I completely agree with you it, it does allow that intimate contact that's one reason why I hand water that's one reason why I rarely use gloves when I'm transplanting and seeding and doing most of my gardening activities. It's so that I can have that, that intimate, that, that skin to earth contact, that skin to plant contact with my entire garden. And I completely agree with you. That's, that's one reason to do it and or definitely one of many reasons that you can continue gardening. Wow, Jay, you're up to 19. Finding gardening options at all price points, free, upcycled, cheap, regular price, investments. Oh, that's a fantastic reason. I like that. <clears throat> it's, it's, I do the same thing. 
<coughs> you know, you, you've seen me buy stuff, you've seen me reuse stuff, you've seen a lot of recycled stuff in my garden. So I completely agree. You can garden at whatever level is appropriate for you. And you don't have to stay at that level. You can move to other levels of cost in the garden. So you're fantastic. 19. I'm, I'm sure you'll have number 20 by the time we're done. And I look forward to what that happens to be. Carla says, I'm the same way. No gloves and out there watering and grubbing for weeds in person. Yep. Yep up close and personal you know you've <coughs> you probably heard of those studies of of music being played to plants and some of those studies are have been replicated most of them haven't so there, there isn't some hard science as to what music's effect is on plants regardless i think when i talk to my plants it makes a difference now it might not make a difference to the plant but it makes a difference to me having the conversation with the plant and every now and then a plant gets better if that's what we're talking about and so i feel better about talking to the plant and i like to think the plant feels better because i talked to it so do i have a personal relationship with my garden absolutely i talk to it all the time i talk to the insects i talk to the birds now, that's just me. Yes, you might say I'm a little crazy, but that's okay. That's how I choose to do it, and you can choose to do it however you want. And it's one of those things that observation is important, and what we observe can be skewed by our own opinions and attitudes. So if you think talking to your plants makes the plant grow better and you observe that the plant grows better, who's to say it isn't your talking that made that happen? It could just be that you're out in your garden watering and weeding and doing all those other things. That's a big factor, but get involved, be personal, be part of your garden, and I think you'll benefit from it. And like I said, I think the garden benefits too. <clears throat> Prepper Chris is saying nature is good to talk to people, not as much. Okay, yeah, you know, and, and yeah, I, I think sometimes it's easier to talk to the garden than it is to talk to other people. I also know that the garden talks to me. I said that in videos, you know, plants talk to us. They'll tell you what's going on by how their leaves are, are shaped and colored and how the flowers are growing and all the rest. So listen to your garden too. It's not just a one-way conversation. You can definitely learn things from listening to what your garden is telling you. <coughs> Rachel says, I talk to everything, including myself. Yeah, ain't, isn't that the truth? Positive energy, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, speak in a positive way to yourself, to your plants, to everything else. Paul always talks to the butterflies when they pass through. Yep, I tell them, welcome, and good to see them again. I think that's fantastic. Cheryl says, sure, I tell my flowers how beautiful they are. <laughs> that's good. And Bohemian Herbology, yeah, they will move when you talk to them too. Uh, I haven't necessarily observed that. I have suspected that I've seen a reaction in plants from time to time. Again, totally non-scientific, but if that's what you see and that's what you observe, more power to you. Jackie talks to the rabbits. They think they are still in silent. Yeah, I've got um, not as many rabbits in the backyard now. Mala does a good job of keeping them away from the garden, but I've got rabbits in the front, and, and the rabbits I have are funny because... They'll be out in the front, I'll walk out, and they just freeze. They, they think you can't see them if they're not moving. And I usually walk up to them and talk to them and let them know it's okay, and then they run away. So it's, it's fun. Scott planted the first garden since buying a house in Saskatchewan. It's been a great experience. Good for you. My spaghetti squash and sugar pumpkin plants are really doing great. Can't wait for next year. That's awesome. Fantastic. And that's... That, that's the first garden experiences, especially when they're good, will keep you going. That's why I say create those memories and remember those memories because Saskatchewan is a challenging region, as you know, and it's not always going to go well 
in the years ahead. But especially when you can look back on your spaghetti squash and your sugar pumpkins, you can say that's why you do it. And next year, just keep adding to the list of those successes, of those things that are working out the way they are supposed to, or maybe surprise you and work out better than you were expecting. So that's fantastic. Okay, let's see. Rolling down, catching up a little bit. <coughs> Urban Chicken Mama says, my girlfriend was over and asked why I was sitting looking out my windows, looking at all my pretty plants, of course. She laughed and walked away. Ah, she should have stayed there and looked at your plants with you. I, I do a lot of that. I, I'm always, you know, this doesn't surprise you. I'm always looking at my landscape and thinking about the future, enjoying the moment. But in the enjoyment of the moment, I'm also always thinking, what more can I add to make it even more enjoyable? What can I modify to make it more enjoyable? And occasionally, and this is when it just reaches the pinnacle of success, I'll look at a section of, of flowers or fruit or whatever it happens to be with that thought, what can I do better next time? And occasionally the answer is nothing. You've, you've done it. It's perfect. The, the flowers, the, the insect activity, the harvest, whatever it happens to be, you can't do better. One of those moments to do that snapshot in your brain to remember. And I've got a few of those, not as many as I would like because I'm always trying to make it better. But those moments when you look at something and you realize nature has done everything that nature does with your assistance and it couldn't be any better. And just soak that in. Spend as much time as you can in that spot. Just soak up the moment as long as possible and recognize sometimes you did everything right. And it is one of those kind of things that oh, when you can when you can have that moment, it's it's, it's just fantastic. It, it really is one of those things. And it <clears throat> it may be less than you think. I've had some of those moments where where I was I was growing fruit trees, for instance, and I've mentioned this before. Apricots are so hard to grow here in Colorado. And and there's been one point in particular, one year, and I had five apricots on that tree. That was one of those moments. Oh, I did it. I grew apricots. Now, for someone in California where five apricots grows on a single branch and you've got 100 branches, it's no big deal. But for me in Colorado, that was one of those, those moments of absolute success. And I still remember just, just standing, watching the fruit on the tree and just having that moment of just absolute satisfaction. So if you can find those moments, log them in your memory banks so you have those moments for every moment in the future that you can access. <clears throat> so uh, let's see how I win the lottery says my garden is a blank canvas. Oh, yeah. Please watch my garden tour video to see what I need. I'm learning and need pointers. Any comments will be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we'll take a look. <coughs> they, I, I like, in fact, that's that's how, for those of you that have been watching my videos regularly, those of you that are new to the channel, if you go back three years, all of the videos I've done in three years are at my new house. And I started literally with a blank slate. I brought in heavy machinery. I leveled the background. I started with nothing and everything has been built since then. I love doing that. That's one of the reasons I garden is to build the garden. All those other things I've talked about so far are important aspects for why I do it. But for me, it's that satisfaction of the build and the creation, and then reaching the point where a plant is growing. <clears throat> so I like the idea of a blank canvas because that's the way I do it. And that, that's really the approach I like to take. And so as, as you're doing all this, so I've, I've been talking about a lot intentionally on creating those memories and approaching how you garden and more importantly, why you garden with the intent of creating as many memories as you can. Hopefully more good memories and bad memories, but bad memories are 
an important aspect of it, like I talked about earlier, but creating those memories. <clears throat> As you do that, I, I encourage, I, I ask, I implore you to have others involved, to not do it by yourself. We've talked about the grandkids. We've talked about the kids. We've talked about school kids. We've talked about friends. We've talked about grandmothers. When there's someone else involved in your gardening journey, I think it makes it more memorable, more important, but really one of those things that you should and you can look at as really being worthwhile. And treasure those moments. Treasure those people. And it's not always just people. It's the animals. And, and, and sure, it's the wildlife that we talk to. But, but it's our garden mates. It's, it's the dogs. It's the cats. It's, it's our family members who are the pets that we welcome into our garden. And so many of my memories have my pets, my dogs, my garden dogs as part of the memory. And, and that's important. And I encourage that you, you create those moments because you won't have them for as long as you would like them to be. And I'll talk more about this next week. But, but treasure the people and the animals that are part of your garden. I'll leave you with that. I'll see you next week with much more about memories and the importance of what we treasure in our gardens. I'm Gardener Scott. Have a great week.